today, the message is entitled, Acts of Hope in These Hard Times. For families with young children, a PDF file is available to help them with the message. There is a coloring page based on Acts 1 with the word witnesses on it because it is Ascension Sunday. We thank Illustrated Ministry in making the PDF file freely available during the pandemic for our families with younger children. As an activity, parents and children can play I Spy with My Little Eye for a few minutes before the message. During the game I Spy, spy with your eye one of your family members or a family member in a photograph that happens to be in the room and have your children guess. After playing the game, tell the children that not only do we see colors and shapes, we also see the actions of others. Then ask them what kind of actions they have seen their siblings or you, mom and dad, do this past week. Ask them what kind of actions God wants the family to be doing. Ask them what kind of action God wants the church to be doing. To close, first tell the children that God wants us to share God's love by our actions. And when our actions are loving, people will know we are Christians by our love. Second, ask the children to think about what kind of action that is loving they can do for someone on this day, the Lord's Day. Let us pray. Open the eyes of our hearts, Lord, that we would grow in wisdom and understanding and secure our hope in you. Amen. So a little while ago, I read a story about a soldier named Hiroo Onoda. Onoda had been a Japanese soldier in World War II who was told he was being sent to a specific island in the Philippines. His orders were that he was never to surrender because he was an intelligence officer and his top secret mission was to conduct guerrilla warfare until the Imperial Japanese Army returned for him. Lieutenant Onoda was only 22 years old and an inexperienced graduate of the Futomata Secret Warfare Center when he received his orders. Sincere, loyal, and deeply committed, Onoda believed he could withstand any hardship and ultimately turn even extreme hardship itself into victory. And so, for almost three decades, Onoda would be fanatical in his no-surrender policy outlasting 41 of the surviving members of his garrison who would quit in April of 1946. And he would outlive as well as outlast the last three who chose to remain with him. For almost 30 years, Onoda would wage unending warfare on the island's natives and for almost 15 consecutive years, overrun the native rice fields and burn as much of the crop as possible, all the while longing for, dreaming about, and craving rice, a key part of Japanese diet. For some 339 months, Onoda made his home on ant-infested mountains, constantly relocating to prevent capture while never letting the natives forget about his presence. Although he never communicated with friends and family back home, Onoda's friends, who knew that the war was over, tried to coax him out of the jungle by leaving newspapers about. Interestingly, he dismissed the newspapers as he dismissed the search parties sent to him as ploys by the Americans. He would not be morally weak and be fooled by enemy propaganda. Early in 1974, a Japanese university dropout would pitch a tent in the mountains Onoda roamed and raise a Japanese flag, determined to wait for Onoda himself. This would set in motion the eventual arrival of his formal commanding officer to the Philippines in order to rescind in person his original orders to Lieutenant Onoda who would surrender to the president of the Philippines then in March of 1974. When Onoda returned to Japan, he was greeted as a hero. 
but on that island in the Philippines where he had terrorized inhabitants for decades. Many never forgave him for the lives that he took. I was fascinated by this story of Hiro'o Onoda, a man who admitted to being competitive and feeling shame if he could not carry out his order when he had an interview with ABC. His passionate nationalism, strong sense of duty, and absolute aversion to shame evoked feelings of pride in one country and unforgiveness in another. Onoda's actions were both admired and hated. Actions. Our thoughts, beliefs, and values guide and inspire our actions. The author of Ephesians knows this as he petitions God in prayer, asking God to give recipients of his letter spiritual wisdom and insight, asking God that followers of Jesus would be intelligent and discerning that they would have wisdom to see clearly and really understand who Christ is. And why all this asking for wisdom and understanding on behalf of fellow followers? Well, so that followers of Christ might grow in their knowledge of God, so that they can see exactly what it is Christ is calling them to do, that they grasp the immensity of this glorious way of life Christ has for Christ's followers, that with eyes of hearts enlightened, they would know what is the hope to which Christ has called them. Eyes of enlightened hearts. Here, the word enlightened means to give understanding to. So perhaps understanding hearts would be a more helpful phrase. Understanding hearts. I think one of the reasons why I'm so fascinated by the story of Onoda is I wonder if he had any understanding whatsoever for the island's inhabitants. I wonder, did he have any understanding of how his actions hurt and negatively impacted the families victimized by his guerrilla warfare? I wonder, did he ever have moments of insight and stirrings of compassion that would encourage him to question his duty to the imperial army? As people who follow Jesus, we follow the one who willingly chose to suffer with the oppressed, the persecuted, the powerless. As followers of Jesus, we also follow the one who was raised from the dead in order to reveal God's power over violence and death. As followers of Jesus, we also follow the one who ascended to heaven and whose power is now given to us because Christ is the head of the church. And Christ's resurrection and ascension matter. They matter because they are the source and focal point of our hope. Hope. We are called to hope. Called to hope in Christ and because of Christ. Called to hope because we can expect God to be good. Called to hope because we can be confident in finding healing, abundant life, and eternal life in the salvation that Jesus gives. We are called to hope and as a church to live out of that hope. As the state of emergency drags on and real fears of a second wave of COVID-19 plague some experts and many of us ordinary lay folk, there is a real danger of fatigue. The reality is our energy is finite. Our resolve is often limited. None of us can endure difficult times that stretch for months or years without a greater power to sustain us. And what a great power Christ gives to us, the church. With all this physical distancing, it can feel like the church has little power as the government enforces restrictions. Let us trust, however, that our God is moving in ways yet to be revealed to us. Let us trust that God is moving in ways despite forces beyond our control. God will reveal to us what God is doing. So let us remember the words from the book of Isaiah. I am about to do a new thing, says the Lord. Now it springs forth. 
Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. God is making a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. So let us cling to the wondrous mystery of the resurrection and ascension. Let us remember the prayer of Ephesians 1, prayers for spiritual wisdom and insight that we would grow in our knowledge of God, prayers for hearts that would be flooded with light, enlightened hearts, understanding hearts, that we would know the hope to which we have been called. So let us rest in God's power. So let us act in hope so that the world will know we are Christians by our love. Amen.